In uh, 2005, you were involved in the Lake Bollock Eel Festival. Have I said that correctly? Yes, you have. Um, and it was set up as a contemporary celebration upon Indigenous traditions. Do, can, oh, there's a lot to talk about. Can you give us a little bit of a rundown on how it got started, please? I still had a deep yearning to try and connect with people, and I, I just had this... I just the absence of people from the country really haunted me and I wanted to what can we do about that I, 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 I had this idea of walking in, in the land mm. walking with people back through the ancestral country mm. that they'd been removed from so I floated this idea with Uncle Banjo's family because he'd be passed on by then and they were all supportive that we're going to walk from the mouth of the Hopkins River and follow the, the river upstream and then up the creek to Lake Bollock the way young eels would travel to get to the inland lakes. Yeah. Because the whole thing about Lake Bolick in um, pre-colonial times, it was, it was a site of a gathering that happened every year after the autumn rains. Yep. That the lake would overflow, and that's when the eels would be trying to migrate, get to the sea. Yes. And that's when uh, the local clan that had jurisdiction over it, would, everyone would be invited in. You'd have up to a 1,000 people camp there for several weeks. Yeah, doing all the business of the day, the, the, the having big eel feasts. Yeah, yeah. They thought all, all the families could put a trap in right down the, the outlet, and everybody could get a feed. And uh, it was a, even now, kuyang or punyat, as the language names for it, is still the most favoured fish for people that way. It's very nutritious, and they're easy yep. to get. Yeah. And they used all this hydrology and stuff. I mean, budge bims down there. They got all that going now as a tourist attraction now. Yeah. So anyway, we organised this walk, and I remember starting there, and we had um, Uncle uh, Banjo's son and, and daughter involved, and some of his grandsons and that. And we walked. To, we took eight days, but we walked all the way up to Lake Bolak as if we were travelling overland, going to the gathering. And I just envisaged wow. having a little campfire on the beach and having a sing song. Yeah. But by this stage, there was like-minded people in the district. Um, non-indigenous people but they they like like the idea of having a proper festival you know with a marquee you know yes so that's what happened Stage. and uh we had like a thousand people turn up to the first one and uh um, wow all these artists played and we had dancing and stuff the first time there'd been you know any kind of um corroboree there <laughs> probably 150 200 years or something but wow um gives me goosebumps thinking about so that bro. It, it was important to have a festival inspired by gatherings from pre-colonial times because you, you need to keep those links those deep connections you know Absolutely. something felt right about it and the only one mm. other one i've heard in, of in australia that's similarly inspired is the bunya dreaming thing yeah that happens in gubby gubby country in the sunny coast because they used to have gatherings ripped for the bunya nuts you know that's right and i've spoken to beverly hand about it and they've had revived that again too and they don't have it every year though but sure and we only have the eel festival now every two years anyway sure so that was that these activities <coughs> made it were profoundly meaningful for fun and seemed to validate my return to my own country you know absolutely so wow. yeah uh, and we did walks every year for quite a while for, uh, along various stream systems in the area uh quietly kind of we were walking through a lot of damaged land from industrialized farming but we still found a lot of things a lot of evidence indigenous occupation scar trees all the rest of it stone uh fish traps and things yeah and we just felt everyone was inspired by it and we just had a small group up to 16 no more than 18 people and there's usually two or three um indigenous people walking with us as well but we had just yep. a lot of other like-minded people of all walks of life who, who wanted to just come and and just the act of walking and in country and then we had a couple of support vehicles taking away gear food and everything yeah and just like getting just gets getting into the land and and walking it and and not like a bush walk you know stomping around oh look at that great view but a different kind of walking yeah. we're actually yeah following ancient pathways because all those stream systems were like highways you know people walking up and down yep um they're often borders between clans and stuff and sure and we just felt i don't know i just felt deeply moved and i got a couple of songs out of those those activities but but it was an attempt to really try and connect in a deep way to the yeah, land. Yeah. And we got blessed, Uncle Banjo. And I mean, not Uncle Banjo. 
Uncle Ted Lovett used to send us off with a blessing and welcome to country. And, wow, that's powerful. Uh, yeah, and um, we walked downstream from the, the mountains where the Fiery Creek rose and all the way to Lake Bolick. We did that a couple of times. Yep. We've done the Warren River. We did the Mount Emu Creek. Uh, yeah. We did the Hawkins River over two or three different <coughs> years, doing different sections. And yeah, it's so really powerful when you have the elders with you. Yes, yes. And, like, and you actually dwell. You've got to learn to listen and dwell in a place. Yeah, you know. You do. And um, it's, it's really about taking notice. Yeah. Um, and it's the same principle in a way. I mean, even when I told Sammy, well, all the language and law has been lost in my area, he sort of said, oh, you can pick that language up. I thought, shit, can I? Come on now. But... Yeah. It's a, the premise is you go and sit down in country and you listen and observe and the land will teach you. 